Hello, I'm Louise Chun with another Zoom interview for welldoing.org. Today, I'm with Andrea McLean, who's well known to thousands, millions of you uh, from Loose Women uh, she, as a TV presenter and an author. But more recently, uh, she's written a book called This Girl is on Fire, which has got uh, loads of great advice and tips for people in dealing with their life, particularly women in midlife but it's also got an incredible story of her breakdown last year. So first I'd like to say welcome, Andrea. Lovely to see you. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. I really genuinely appreciate it. Thank you. Terrific. Well, I, I read your book and I think it's terrific and many, many people will get a lot out of it, but they will also probably be surprised by your story, which I'd like you just to very briefly tell, if you would. Well, the, the whole book came about because last year I had a breakdown, which will surprise a lot of people because I carried on working throughout the majority of it. And I know a lot of people will think, how can you keep on working through a breakdown? So many reasons. Shame keeps you going because you don't want to admit that you're actually falling apart. I think as, as women, we're, we're, we're so used to sort of putting on this, this mask of respectability, of, of showing up, of, of making sure that everyone else is okay. And so that these were some of the things that I wanted to address in the book. But also I wanted to show that really all of us could do with, with a, taking a long, hard look at ourselves and, and what isn't working for us. So you may not necessarily have had to go through something as extreme as what I did was I ended up having a breakdown because I didn't address certain traumatic events that happened to me in my past and, and through one thing and another, it built and built and built until trying to hold it all in, work more, pack my days, be busy, just didn't work. So if you're not going through that, the, the, there are still things that you can look at because sometimes we can all experience death by paper cuts. It's tiny, tiny incremental little things that are leading to this feeling of, unhappiness, dissatisfaction. We, we, if you find yourself that you're constantly moaning and not doing anything about where you are, this is a book that hand to your friend. If there's a friend in your group that does that, maybe quietly give them, give them one as a little present. And it just allows you to work through certain exercises, figure it out what it is that isn't working for you, what it is that you actually want, and then how you can go and get it. Now, Andrea, you made the decision to see a therapist and you say in your book that the UK uh, in general, people have a fear of therapy. They think of that um, with some shame um, and that uh, it has a stigma with it. How yeah. did you overcome those feelings to reach out and find somebody to help you? That's such a good question. And I think that anybody listening who maybe thinks maybe therapy is for me but I don't want to do it because it's embarrassing it's shameful people will think well just pull yourself together there are people going through way worse things than you are who do you think you are going for there what are you um that's how I felt I I grew up in a generation where you do just put a stiff upper lip my parents come from a generation where you don't ask anybody else for help. You don't tell people outside of the house what it is that that you're that you're feeling. So there was a lot of ingrained prejudice there um, against therapy, even though I believe in self-help, I believe in mind, body, spirit, in looking after myself, all of these things that I practice and do. For some reason, therapy was something that I thought, oh, no, no. I realize now that's ridiculous. For me, it became so extreme that I had to go and ask for help. It was the equivalent of falling over and breaking my leg and then not going to the doctors. I had to go and see someone uh, about how I was feeling within myself. Once I did, oh my goodness, it was such a beautiful experience because actually you realize all you're doing is talking to another human being and you're talking to someone who isn't so ingrained in your story that they, they don't have an invest, some sort of vested interest in the outcome in so much as will it be beneficial to them, which is what a friend might have, your partner might have, your parents might have, this sort of thing. And I realized that I've been ridiculous, totally ridiculous to have any kind of, of prejudice against the idea of therapy. And I wish I had done it years ago. It would have saved me years, years of lugging around 
like a really silly Santa Claus with a bag full of rubbish presents, lugging around all this stuff that just wasn't working for me anymore. And I didn't just do conventional therapy. I also did CBT as well. And that's something I would hugely, hugely advocate and would recommend to anyone. And because I did the two of them side by side, um, I was seeing, you know, one, what the, my, my, my normal therapist, I suppose is the word, uh, in person and once a week. And then I was also having um, CBT therapy. This was over FaceTime which means it will work really well right now. Obviously different parts of the world are, are still in various stages of lockdown. I never met her physically. It was like therapy, but with a speed turned up. It made everything happen so much more quickly. She cleared blockages. She took me back to times in my life where I realized I'd been They'd formed little hooks in my brain that I'd then been hanging different experiences on and, and it'd been cementing certain thought processes in my mind. And it was incredible. And I'd highly recommend it to anyone. That's fantastic to hear because we're a therapist matching platform and you know our whole being is based on that it would be very helpful to people if they only knew that actually it was not as uh, extremely uh, perhaps embarrassing and stigmatizing as, as they think. Yeah, and uh, do you know, I'm you... really open about it. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, because I have um, changed my thought process with it, I'm really open about it now. And I'm open about it with the kids. And, uh, you know, I've always been in, we've been very, we're very sit down and chat about it. Parents, we're not buttoned up parents that maybe previous generations were even last night which is why i interrupted my 13 year old daughter said um are you and nick still going to counseling and nick and i said no we're, we're not right now that actually finished a year ago but we would go back again if there was something that that was a problem and we've arranged actually she has speaking therapy for for normal things that she's going through in her life we actually do it through the through the school and it's made us realize that actually what we're doing is we are we're giving her tools so that she can learn how to process her normal pubescent thoughts you know the difficulties that she's having and i'm so pleased that my thought processes have changed i'm going to save her decades decades of having to unpack things and so hopefully she can move forward and 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 lead a full rich and brain clear life which is something that many of us that are my age many in in our 50s didn't do yes yes i think that's terrific and 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 really you know well done you and <laughs> your husband nick for both uh seeking counseling if there is anything in a relationship that can be improved i think that's a, a yeah. counseling is a great idea for many couples um would you say there are any great insights about yourself that you you got from the professionalism of um, psychotherapy where you know you talk about the CBT which is changing your behavior but the psychotherapy when you're sort of looking at your own experience of life and the patterns that one that one falls into would you say there was any great sort of insight that you use daily and you think yes that that's my that was my pattern and it's not now I think for me the, the key thing was and, and habits and pattern are such such great terms because we do things without thinking and we react without thinking we we you know if a problem occurs we 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 are we our go to i now understand is just like a groove in our brain that we could we go into and that's how we always react to things mm -hmm. and speaking therapy made me step back and look at well why do you think that you're reacting that way why do you think that you automatically in my instance, it'd be different for everybody. Um, why do you automatically feel that you, if, if say for example, someone is angry, you automatically have to acquiesce, that you have to make yourself a little bit smaller, um, that, you, that you, your, your go-to is to soothe and calm. Even though inside you're, you're thinking, that's completely wrong. Uh, one, you're totally out of order. Two, you're, you're factually incorrect. All of these things. Why is that my go-to? And I realized that it wasn't just experiences that I've had in the past 20 years as an adult through my unfortunate experiences with uh, another person. Um, it was also set in process by 
I would say really kind, loving parents, but who are also very strict. So that the, the it was sort of set in stone when I was little, you know, that when when a grown up speaks, you do not answer back and you don't question. You just do as you're as you're told. You know, the whole seen and not heard thing of, of children, which of course is 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 wonderful and that's how kids grow up to be well behaved. But if there's never any feeling that as a person you're allowed to question or have a of a different opinion that somehow ingrains itself in your head and my sister and I laugh about it now and, and you know and I do have to stress we have a wonderful relationship with our with our parents they are great parents but our sister, my sister and I laugh about it now she's 47 and I'm I'll be 51 in a couple of days we still now feel if we go into a meeting and there is an older man in there that we treat him like our dad and we'll automatically acquiesce. And therapy made me realize just because there is a, uh, an older gentleman in the room, he doesn't necessarily know what he's talking about and he isn't always right. And that's years of programming, if you like, that I had to sort of unpack. Yes, well, a lot of, of uh, people's patterns are set in childhood, you know, by their parents, um, by their, you know, in their relationship with their siblings and, and so on. Mm. Um, and I think that that you know, possibly people, possibly women who are who want to be loved and popular and and you know have good relationships with their parents and their families, etc., try to make themselves smaller to to uh, always be uh, loved. Uh, but you can girl. Be, you can still be loved <laughs> and have your say. Yes exactly exactly so that that's that's why i do think that you know obviously there's a balance of of respect and understanding and and allowing someone to speak but not just so that you can wait till they finish to get your point in allowing someone to speak so that you're actually listening to what they're saying and i think if that's something that i can try and and teach my children that a conversation is not literally waiting until someone stops speaking so you can jump in and hammer your point home it's about you know you got two of these and one of these use them yeah yeah um, why did you want to write a book about this experience of the breakdown and then the, the recovery and the therapy and so on? Because it, it I journal, I, I find journaling very therapeutic. I, 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 I've always had a notebook in my bag. I guess it's years of journalism training or what have you. I always have a book in my bag in case an idea pops into my head or, or what have you. And years ago, I started the practice of I split the book in half. And at the, at the front of the book is my to-do list and every, everything that I've got to do. And at the back of the book, is just my thoughts, you know, things that happen through the day, whether it's, you know, venting, getting things off my chest. And there was one day, and I was in the middle of, of going through what I was, was going through. I hadn't yet sought any help. So I was still feeling quite raw, I suppose. And there, we were on this phone call with, with someone that we know, and it was on speakerphone. And this person was moaning. Oh my gosh, they were, they were just moaning and moaning and moaning. And we had been trying to help them and give them advice. And everything, that, that every bit of advice that we had been given, literally that we'd given them like the past month, two months, six months, a year, year before, year before that, they weren't taking any of it on board. And they were still moaning about the same things and really being quite vicious. And, and they, everything was everybody else's fault. They're just thrashing about on their own, enjoying their own misery, if you like. And I just thought, I can't listen to this anymore. And I went upstairs, dug my notebook out my bag, and I wrote down what would eventually become the prologue to a book. I didn't know it would end up being a book. And basically I vented and I just wrote that life can be hard sometimes and things happen to all of us, but unless you do something about it, nothing is going to change. And it doesn't matter whether what you're going through is huge or whether like her, it was day-to-day -day little irritations that she was taking no responsibility for, blaming everyone else, and not looking at what was in her control and what she could actually change. Nothing in your life is going to change. And I just went, Bleh, and I wrote it all down. And then sort of a little while later, literally a few months later, and I was going through my process of, of finding things that worked for me. Obviously I was having therapy, but I was also looking at my habits that, that I had, not just in my 
my mental behavior, but in, in my, in my physical behavior as well, I was like pushing myself. I was actually pushing myself too hard. And I realized that we need a mixture of push and pull. For me, I was, I was pushing, pushing, pushing all the time to try and keep myself busy. But inside my light had gone out. The flame had gone out for some people their flame is too high. They're, they're full of rage, but it's impotent rage. So I realized actually these two things are the reasons why people need help. And so like, like I said, when, when we were first introducing each other, I realized if I can put all of these things together in a book, I could be helping people who not only were maybe going through something like me, which was overcoming and processing, whether it's a traumatic event or a, a, a series of traumatic events, or just overcoming that, that day to dayness, that I could help. And all I've ever wanted to do is help. This is my third book. My previous book was helping women of a, of a certain age. Um, I, I had to, for medical reasons, I had to have a, a full hysterectomy. So I went into full surgical menopause. And I then realized that thousands of women didn't have access to good, clear information. So I wrote a book with a doctor, literally going, right, here you go. This is everything you need. You don't have to suffer. Here's information. And this next book was a very similar process. Here's a hideous experience that I've had. Let me save you from going through the same hideous experience by giving you all this information. So that was where it came about, to be a little, a little handbook for women that they can just keep referring to. You know, I like to think of it as, you know, you know, you see a TV chef on the telly and you think, oh, they're so good at cooking Italian. And then they hold up the book and go, you can learn Italian. You can learn to cook Italian. And you think, I'm going to buy that book. And you buy the book and you think, that looks really pretty. Look at all those great recipes. And then you put it on your shelf and you never look at it again. And two weeks later, you go, God, I really wish I could cook Italian. You've literally got a book on your bookshelf. That's what this book is like. Don't just look at it and think, that looks really great and stick it on your bookshelf. Take it out, fold over the pages, make it, you know, it's tactile, bend it over, underline stuff and use it, use it as a tool. Because just like you'll never learn to cook proper pasta by having a book on a shelf, you'll never really learn to change your habits. If you just buy a book and think that's it, it's going to solve your problems. You have to read it and use it. Well, I think it's, it's very good because it doesn't just tell your story, but gives lots of advice and includes advice from the other people as well. Yeah. Um, we're get, getting towards the end, but I wanted to ask you if you have uh, tips. We have a, a section that we're, we're putting together called Coping with COVID. And we're asking people if they have one idea or recommendation that they would say to people, you know, we're just finding out that this is not something that was all over by the autumn. This yeah. is a much longer um, time frame and People are, I think, really struggling with the idea of how are they going to keep themselves uh, buoyant and, um, and feeling positive. I wondered, yeah. you seem to be somebody who has a, now a very positive campaign going and an idea with your website too, This Girl Is On Fire, same name as your, as your book. Um, I wonder, could you just give us, Andrea, one coping with COVID tip? It's going to be really hard to, to get it down to one because my brain's going boop, 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 boop. Well, like and, and, <laughs> and, uh, um, the first tip that I would give is control what you can control and let everything else go. Because at the moment, all of us are feeling overwhelmed by the huge amount of rolling news that is constantly being fed to us in terms of what's happening, not only uh, where we live, but around the world as well in terms of with what's happening with COVID. And it can feel huge and overwhelming. So what I would say is control what you can control. And in that way, that will instantly make you feel that you're, you are taking positive steps to make your environment uh, something that works for you. So, for example, switch off all your uh, notifications on your on your phone. Don't have constant news pinging up on your phone. That's literally just feeding stress into you. Um, in in terms of your in, your in environment, control. Try and get enough sleep. Don't necessarily down a bottle of wine every night just to numb how awful everything is because your, your brain is not going to be thinking clearly. Do try. These are all things that are well within our own. They're all well within our own, our own control. Try and have some, some 
positive um, habits that you do every morning. For example, and this all comes under one tip, I suppose. Uh, the first thing I do when I get out in the morning is, is I make my bed. So what that means is I've already achieved something for the day. I look I, from seconds after getting out of bed, it's already neat and tidy. I've achieved something. So mentally, my brain is going, tick, you've done something today. Well done. Then when I get in the shower, I always finish it. Some of you may recoil in horror at this, but I always finish my shower with a cold, icy blast of water. And I do something that's called Wim Hof breathing. I don't know if, if you've heard of it, where you, you inhale really deeply from your nose and you exhale really strongly to your mouth. It's not pleasant. You have to brace yourself as you turn the tap down, but do it. I'd really recommend that you do it. Why? Because then physically you've done something with your body. You, you've charged it. I, I tend to think of this, 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 this type of breathing and the, and the cold water exercise is that it's exercised your lungs. It's got your heart pounding. So already you're doing internal exercise. So that's two. You already feel like you've achieved something. And three, do something for your gut. So I take a gut shot every morning. If you, don't, if you don't have one that you like, you can make your own kombucha. You can have a few spoonfuls of sauerkraut, something that's got some sort of probiotic in it. So the, the, and the, all of these things, you haven't necessarily done anything. You haven't had to go to the gym. You haven't had to you know, leap about. I would say try and get walking fresh air as well. But within the first 10 minutes, you have already achieved three amazing things that are within your control and that will make you feel better. That was a really long-winded answer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's terrific, Andrea. Thank you very much. Andrea, I've been talking to Andrea McLean, who's the author of this book, uh, which I highly recommend. It's called This Girl Is On Fire, and it's out now. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you so much. Thank you.